What's up, everybody? I'm The Hook. And I'm The Blade. And together we're, you know. Welcome to the (laughs) Hook Blade podcast, (laughs) a show about all things Assassin's Creed. I'm joined, as is tradition, by your host, Timothy. Tim, uh, may I call you Tim? Yeah. Cool. This is our 25th episode. That's kind of cool. Yeah. 25. 25 is a nice number. That's 25 little play on the Hookblade podcast title. Oh, yeah, dude. You know I'm going to make a compilation of those by the end of the year. (laughs) This episode is part of our ongoing coverage of the launch of Assassin's Creed Valhalla. In the past few weeks, we've talked about the gameplay. We've talked about the story. For this episode, I think we should turn our eyes and ears, mostly our ears, Back to some of the earlier episodes of our podcast. (laughs) I want to listen to some of the things we said about the news and about our expectations for Valhalla and just, I don't know, see how they panned out. What what do you think? What do you think about that idea? I think it sounds lovely. (laughs) The standard Pokemon book made has two parts. I've combed through our library of Valhalla news roundups and news-centric episodes to find some clips for us to react to, respond to, and reflect on. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Self-reflect. This episode is all about self-reflection. Tim, I think the nice thing about this, uh, this idea is I think it'll give us the opportunity to talk about some of the smaller details and things with Valhalla that I think we didn't have room for in our review episodes, but we've kind of talked about privately about some of these things and gone, oh, I wish I could have said this. I wish I could have said that. Yeah, there there certainly were some things in the occasional Valhalla news roundup that weren't like big UB4 details that we covered. So it would be nice to revisit some of those smaller things and see what actually came to fruition. I think it will be. I think it'll be nice. It'll be fun. It'll be cool. It'll be good. We're going to have a it'll chill time <laughs> listening to ourselves talk about Valhalla and then talking about ourselves talking about Valhalla. Let me uh, let me pull the clips. Clippy time. Clip show. We're doing Eclipse. You know, is, is this kind of like... <laughs> <laughs> yes? This is kind of like um, those like standard cable like ABC family shows where yeah. they all have a clip show at the end of the season or, or worse... The finale is a clip show. Oh, oh, <laughs> I there's something really disgusting about the the slowly dawning realization that you're watching a clip show when it'll go into a whole scene from something you've already watched. And you're just like, wait a second. <laughs> is that all this episode is going to be is scenes? I already know. What's the show? Do you remember? There was a show that did a clip show, but all of the clips had never happened in previous episodes at all. Oh, I have no idea. There's a show that did that. I can't remember what it is. It might have been Community. That's the kind of shit they would do. Someone tell me in the comments what show did that. But for now, I thought it would be appropriate to start with, uh, Tim, this is the very first thing we said ever about <laughs> Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Uh-oh. For, I think, both of us, Valhalla is maybe the most exciting Assassin's Creed game in a long time. Yeah, for sure. It's been a while. Uh, for those of us who are kind of fans of the more classic style of Assassin's Creed, it, it was hard to kind of get excited for games like Origins and Odyssey. But Valhalla is, is they're making the right moves. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean... They're, they're saying the right things. They, they, they know what we want to hear. <laughs> I haven't been this excited about an Assassin's Creed since probably Unity. Mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, you know... <laughs> hey, it's in like, our defense... They were saying the right things. They were saying the right things. You were totally right about that. Yeah. It's just it's funny how it's funny how you, it's funny how you made the distinction between Origins and Odyssey like Valhalla was going to be any different. I know. I mean, we didn't we didn't even know anything really about what the game looked like, but I also like I think it was very easy to be excited for Origins. That's another thing that strikes me when I listen to that is like like I was more excited for Origins than I probably was for Valhalla because yeah you just didn't know until you played Origins how different it was going to be and Origins has a has a great cinematic like the trailer <laughs> yeah it has a great cinematic trailer 
There was a part of the ap- that that first episode where we argued about the origin cinematic trailer. Yeah, because I, I know that you don't like it too much. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. I like the what is it, Leonard Cohen? That's a good. It's a good song. Anyway. I, I I just like. I feel like the the battle on the bridge and the sandstorm is amazing. I love it. You want it darker? <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> it is. Kind, it is kind of dope. Um, yeah, so we've got a lot from this first episode. Here's here's another little taste. Really, I think mixing old school and new school is kind of the 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 modus operandi of Valhalla. The way that they've been talking about it is that they've been saying that a lot of things that are important to classic Assassin's Creed fans like you and me are going to be kind of coming back into the fold. For sure. Yeah, I mean, it really seems like they're pulling out all the stops here. Yeah, they sure are. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all right, so they, they got Jesper Kidd back. That was like a sign, it felt like. You know what I mean? For sure, it was. It's hard for me to like I try to I try to go back and wonder like how much of this did we make up uh genuinely like <laughs> how how much of this whole attitude we have in that first episode of like they're going to they're going to make classic fans happy again did we pull that out of our ass I feel like the 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 attitude around it was like whoa okay guys now this is going to be different because of now Darby this and... is pod racing yeah <laughs> but <laughs> it definitely wasn't just us Okay. There are plenty of people that with the Jesper Kid announcement yeah. and with Darby and Ashraf. Yeah, yeah, like that team again because Can I tell you I was I was really looking for a clip of us talking glowingly about Ashraf so we could go, uh <laughs> but we didn't really do that, so we're totally in the clear. The, the there's also the detail about like Origins was Ashraf minus Darby, so the Darby Ashraf team up was definitely worthy of being excited about because of Black Flag. Definitely, definitely. That was, I mean, that was the big thing for me, honestly. At the yeah, time. so that team up kind of in, in, insinuates that, oh, hey, like this, this is like Black Flag uh, coming back, pretty much. All right, next clip. Going to kind of the way that they're doing the longboat in this game, which apparently is called the Drakkar or Drakkar, Drakkar. I don't know. I'm gonna say Drakkar. <laughs> Um, it is something you can call the same way you'd call a horse. They're kind of using it like a horse. Now, there, there's one reason I clipped this. Do is it called the Drakkar? I have no idea. <laughs> I don't. Somehow, I, I don't, don't think, think so. That it is. I don't think so either. I, this is a very minor detail, but I was listening. I was like, wait a second. If it was, it would say "call Drakkar" on the screen. It wouldn't say "call." Right. Long it term. doesn't. Yeah. So it's not where I. That's one of those weird things. I feel like that had to come from somewhere. Someone yeah, said sure. that at some point, but I don't know. Weird shit. There's no way that you just came up with that name. Uh, it, it seems like in that uh, little gameplay, like really short trailer we got. Yeah. Um, Avor like uh, used a horn. Yeah. And that that and my my first thought was that was like during a raid, and that was what you would do to like signal the start of a raid. But maybe that's calling the boat. Maybe. I think you're probably right about the raid thing, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In case it's not eminently clear, the way I like I, I I hear my own what I'm saying in that clip, and I know that in my mind I'm going, Tim's fucking wrong. Yeah, I yeah, I, I could I, <laughs> Yeah. Because literally you just call the ship without doing anything. But you can <laughs> use the horn without being in a raid. So what is the purpose? I've never been able to figure out what using the horn does. Wouldn't it make sense to use it to call your ship? Like, that's not out there. <laughs> no, I don't know why I clearly thought you were wrong about that. I was like, you're, you're not calling the ship. That doesn't make any fucking sense. Like, I don't know why that was where I was at at the time. <laughs> that was where you called the line. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you know, I think you're definitely right about the, the raid thing. <laughs> <laughs> but the ship? No, and I and and the truth is, it's both, and you can just use it. You can, if you start a raid or you call the long ship, Avor blows the horn, which is the most ear piercing fucking sound that's yeah. ever been recorded. I don't know what happens when you just hit use horn. I thought maybe that was like a Ghost of Tsushima had a function you could call remaining enemies to you. So if you're in a camp and you're like, I can't find the fucking bad guys, you call them, which happened to me a bunch in Valhalla. It was like, I'm trying to kill people. I don't know where they are. But right. the horn doesn't do that. Anyway. I have occasionally just used horn and nothing seems to come of it. I thought what was going to happen was there were going to be like environmental puzzles that required some kind of sound, sound activation or whatever. But maybe it's just for fun. 
Maybe it's just an immersive <laughs> detail. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's like in Ghost of Sushi where you can clean the blood off your sword. It's just for fun. When Darby says there's a story structure to this game that has not been seen in any video game before, that gets me pretty torqued. You know what I mean? Well, um, I mean... <laughs> that, that has me excited. I'm not sure, like, because also, I mean, you have the... Uh, we do know that romance options can be used to, uh, like, win over allegiances. Yeah, which so is perhaps, a great yeah, idea. It, yeah, well, it's a great way to use romances instead of just fucking people. <laughs> instead of just, <laughs> like, like, cutting to black and then... Oh, right, that was yeah. fun, wasn't it? Yeah, so probably like there are different ways you could benefit your settlement. Um, in going with certain people in the world could benefit your settlement in different ways, perhaps. Yeah. Not even a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite thing about that clip is reminding myself that at one point Darby said this was a story structure that had never been seen in a video game before. <laughs> um, I don't think that's true. <laughs> I don't think that's true, Darby. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't think it is. I mean, it's definitely like unprecedented. Like it's 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 <laughs> the, <laughs> the, how 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 awful it is to play through is definitely unprecedented. But <laughs> if you're gonna say that like the episodic structure is new to video games, it's not even new to Assassin's Creed. <laughs> I mean, Corey May always said that like. They, you know, the memory sequences were like episodes in a season of television. But like, I was thinking about Red Dead Redemption 2 earlier today because the time that it takes to beat both of these games is pretty close. It's pretty similar. Like, and like, I can tell you for sure, I finished Valhalla like a week ago. I remember more of Red Dead Redemption. <laughs> it's more like a meaningful, emotional story. So, like, it's not even impossible to tell an impactful story in that exact amount of time, but approaching it like you're going to do a season of TV where every episode but five is complete filler, it was not the move. But I digress. There certainly was, like, five seconds of time where it seemed like they came out about the romance options being to win over alliances, and then yeah. they immediately backpedaled on it. And so we weren't <laughs> reporting negative. We, we weren't reporting incorrectly. It just they immediately corrected it. <laughs> and speaking of backpedaling, they've talked about how the world is smaller and it's more detailed. It's less like this big world with every like randomly generated fort or whatever it feels right. like. You don't just have this huge map. It, right. it signals a shift in what their priorities are because Absolutely. most Assassin's Creed games, you probably have corporate saying, well, can we get the map a little bigger than last time? <laughs> just so we can say it's the biggest map. Yeah. I yeah, want the I trailers mean, to say it's the biggest map. Uh, that was so immediately backtracked that we actually had a correction in the comments that we posted <laughs> on that episode. The first episode we ever did. Saying, yeah, no, they were actually, it is the biggest map. It is the biggest map they've ever done. Fuck them. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's cause it's, it's funny how I, I feel like the correction came in trying to be like, no, no guys, it's the biggest one. But the original statement of it not being the biggest one was a positive for so many of us. Yeah. It literally was a big positive And now, but then they came out and they're like, no guys, don't worry. It's the biggest. <laughs> Look, there are plenty of handcrafted elements in, 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 in Valhalla, but the world is pretty empty when you're just going between the locations, certainly. But also let me call out something I wanted to appreciate that I haven't really gotten the opportunity to appreciate on the podcast, which is that the forts, there's definitely fewer of them than in Odyssey. There are a lot right. fewer forts. And when you do go to a fort, it's not like you have four or five items on a checklist where you have to loot four treasures and kill the captain and kill the the whatever and and then at the end it's like congratulations you completed the fort instead the fort just exists on the map it's not specially designated as like a hostile fort or right. anything and the only time you need to go there is either the story demands it or there's a collectible in there and that made a big difference in how i experienced the world feeling like i could just get in get out like i just run sure. in grab my shit and go i hope they continue on that direction i was a little disappointed though that there wasn't just more to do in the forts it was just a matter of like you said either a collectible or story brought you there but it's definitely a, if you if you played odyssey better. you'd have a completely different because there's plenty to do in the forts and after about five of them you'll never want to do one again 
Well, like I'm, but I'm you'll sure have to do a hundred. I'm, I'm sure it's worse. I, I just, yeah. Still though, there's not much to do inside of a fort than just to grab an ingot. Like if there was gear in the forts, I'd much rather go into there. But ingots, out of there is. Point, in, I, I mean, gear is usually in restricted areas. I often, if I find a fort, it's just an ingot inside. Here's a fun one. So one of the things they've talked about along those lines is kind of changing, overhauling the leveling system to where there won't be like player levels and enemy <laughs> levels necessarily. It's more about the gear you have and the skills you have and Absolutely. how that kind of prepares you. <laughs> as long Absolutely. as I like, feel like I'm getting a a whole experience without having to like grind and deck out an entire skill tree, yeah. then I'm happy. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. That's the interesting thing about that clip to me is... I feel like this game escapes the status of grindy, like on a technicality, because the common definition of grindy is that you keep having to break away from the main story and do side content in order to get your level up for the main story. But everything in this game is considered main story. So technically you're not grinding. However, if they took all the filler ass quests and made them optional, and that was the only difference you would definitely be grinding by that standard. It's like a very technical difference that lets them escape right. the grindy designation. Probably the most egregious example of this is there was a complete miscommunication about how power works in the game. It's yeah. it's not an accumulative thing of gear and runes and, and whatnot. It's just the skills that you get. And fun yeah. funnily enough, it's the same amount of XP required to, to quote, level up each time. But... Yeah. Your power is only ever impacted by you buying skills. Like I completely took off all my gear, my power never changed, weapons doesn't matter. So I would have much preferred power to be this accumulation of things. So that way, oh I'm I'm I don't have enough power. Well, maybe instead of needing to just level up, I could go and upgrade my weapons or upgrade my armor. So it would have been this mm -hmm. symbiotic relationship between power and the world. That I don't think they achieved. Yeah. And I think that's what they tried to present it as, but I don't think they really got there. On one hand, you know, they told us you can go to any like area in the game at any level and you won't be gated away from doing particular content. And that's clearly not true. No. Um, you know, you can run into a zealot in an early area and just not be able to fight them. That is content that is gated off because you are supposed to get to a higher level before doing it. At the same time, I also found, you know, certain instances I could go, I could start a raid in an area that was way higher level than me, or even a boss fight with someone way higher level than me. And I could hold my own. It would be challenging, but I could hold my own, which is a stark contrast to an odyssey where you pretty much just can't do anything if you go to a higher level area. So like on some level, it does not feel like a level gated experience except for when it tells you over and over and over again, like this area is higher power than you. You're going to get fucked up. This enemy's higher level than you. You're going to get fucked up. It's a, it's like kind of a skill thing. You can get around it. And I applaud that, but very sloppy communication. And if you also switch the setting to assassinate always, yeah. if you can not pull your hair out with the stealth, then there is a way to go to a high powered area and just still be stealthy. It is difficult, but there yeah. is a way, I suppose. I want to give them credit for that while also realizing that telling that telling us there's no leveling system in this game was like a bold faced lie. They, they, they made a big deal about the word power. And <laughs> I just would have much preferred if I was able to be incentivized to get newer gear or new weapons because that would raise my power um, instead. Of it Yeah, it's just it's like it's like a pointless synonym. This game has no levels, but you can you can upgrade to a higher tier. Yeah, you know, pretty much. Exactly. Yeah. They're kind of trying to make the settlement this very like immersive simulator like place to live. I think they're maybe taking some cues out of the Red Dead Redemption 2 playbook here. You know, you can talk to your war chief about what you're doing. You can check on the other inhabitants who will mostly be characters in the game. You can interact with things. You can lay down in your bed. You can go to sleep. You can fish. You can go fishing. Finally, yeah, Assassin's Creed that, fishing. Finally, honestly. I take it back. <laughs> I don't want fishing. <laughs> <laughs> the fishing was fine i never did it unless i had to there's actually no reason to fish because you can just shoot all of them i mean other than conserving arrows but it's much faster to just shoot the fuckers i don't I hate the fishing but the only reason you have to fish other than like the fishing challenges is those fucking altars that are like i need 10 small bullheads and fucking good luck good luck getting those fucking things 
you can Google best place to find small bullhead and you're going to go to a place that has like three small fish in the entire body of water. And like one of them is a bullhead and you'll just have to spend a fucking hour shooting fish. Kill me. I won't do it. I saw an altar that required 30. Yeah, that, that, that can eat my ass immediately. No, thank you. Not doing it. That's the other thing, too. Sorry, not to backtrack, but you have altars. You have the legendary animals. All of those things, when you beat them, they give you skill points. Every mystery gives you a skill point. But, like, how about, though, like, instead of just... I, Because I feel like I just expedited a, a leveling process by fighting that enemy. It'd be neat if, if it just notched up my power instead of... Oh, hey, here's a, here's now skill point currency. Go spend it. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's weird. Like, usually, I feel like all they did was a very simple flip, where in most games, you have leveled up. Now you have skill points to spend. In this game, it's like, we have given you skill points. You can spend them to level up. Right. So it's like the exact same thing. It's just a different order of actions. Speaking of, we were just talking about the whole guaranteed assassinate thing. The If you try to insta-kill an enemy that's really high level there might be like an unplayably hard <laughs> like rhythm tapping game like lock picking yeah. goes yeah like, yeah yeah like the lock pick i'm i'm cautious about that i have to give him some credit though i think it worked fine i i never used it because i just turned it i turned the setting off i mean i had it on i found it amusing i got peer pressured into turning it off i played it like that for a while and eventually i turned it back on again just to feel alive i guess i don't know I was concerned at this in this clip that they would tell us you can technically assassinate anyone in the game that's a higher level than you, but then you have this rhythm game. And I just thought that if they were really that much higher, it would be impossible to pull off the right. timing. And I guess I never really tried it to see if that would be the case. But in my experience, I never ran into that. I never ran into one that was so hard I could not possibly do it, except for one that forces it. Uh, that gives you like literally a sliver that's that's genuinely meant to be impossible. Like one time in the game that happens, I thought it was going to be like, here, let's just make it exactly like Odyssey and just give you a really hard QTE and then no one will be able to do it and we'll get what we wanted. <laughs> but it was good. It was fine. You can mount wolves as as to, as a vehicle, apparently. I don't, I mean, I don't, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, I'm not a wolf expert. But I don't know if there are wolves big enough that you could mount. I like that one. Because <laughs> I don't think you can, other than the fucking yeah, yeah. DLC mountable wolf. Yeah, it's not like you can, can just find, find one in the, in, the, in, the, in the open world and tame it. <laughs> we really, we did, we all thought that you could just find a wolf <laughs> and mount it. Well, dude, those those early screenshots of the game made it look like you just had like animal companions. <laughs> you and the bear, you and the wolf, like how are we supposed to know anything else? <laughs> yeah, that's poor communication on their part, I think. And then it got even more interesting when Darby made honestly an excellent point on Twitter like, yeah, we can do goofy shit with the animus like you've always been able to. You didn't literally wear Ezio's robes when you were playing as Bayek, you dumb fucks. There is an extreme of it where it's like, let's just do everything goofy and just say it's an animus hack. Right. That's how you get the purchasable, like, unicorn longship pack. Or right. The, you know, Draugr or whatever things that just make you look like a fucking, like you're riding a skeleton horse that's on fire. That shit's ridiculous. And they, it's the same justification as, as this, but, but it's true. Like is, is riding a wolf mount? I don't know. Is, yeah. Can, is that worth doing? We can call it an animus hack. If it makes white wolf whispers happy, it's worth <laughs> it. <laughs> That's true. They say parkour throughout the world will be meaningful and rewarding. I have no idea what that means, but I'm excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> I still don't, I still have no idea what that means. <laughs> listen the parkour is going to be meaningful and rewarding I, what do you want to bet that whomever it was maybe it was ashraf just sort of thought of that on the spot and they were just like yeah the parkour i would if i had to call it two things <laughs> i'd say meaningful and rewarding not even a little bit is it though <laughs> and like I remember no, no 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 I remember watching uh, you know, the whole Ashraf interview then and he was like yeah like we've really handcrafted a parkour experience for players that want to take advantage of it they they can and, and, and it's gonna be very rewarding 
the, I can count on the number of my fingerless <laughs> hand the times <laughs> that that actually happens. <laughs> you can count every finger on your stump. Exactly. To tell me how many times. Oh, my God, dude. Yeah. Uh, editor's note. Tim does not have a stump for a hand. It is never more rewarding to to just climb up because like usually it's like, hey, just go fight him. There's one instance that I that we all know of with the Ruid where you can yeah. climb up around him, but that's the only time I ever well, I suppose there was two. If there's anything he could be talking about here, it would be like the chaseable tattoos. No. And those suck. Yeah, those are not meaningful like, or rewarding. That's very technically a handcrafted parkour experience. In the same way that I could scribble a bunch of bullshit, uh, put it around, tape it around like the walls of my living room and and say I had an escape room. That would be a handcrafted experience. <laughs> It'd just be a really shitty one. Right. And I think it is worth mentioning, too, that you can essentially complete the entire game with the gear that you start with. Yeah, and you can do transmog as well, which, you know, means that you are able to kind of customize the look of your gear without sacrificing the stats, which it should be in every game. Yeah, because as, as you upgrade the uh, the gear, apparently it'll change it'll change appearance, but you can go back to the original appearance if you want to. Not even kind of. No, I don't know how that happens. How is How is transmogrification, or even just the concept of changing the appearance of your upgraded gear? How is that so challenging to implement that you can promise it with certainty months before your game launches and have it not show up in the final release? The thing is, is there is completely a function in Breath of the Wild where once you upgrade your gear, you can you can change the appearance back to the original look. Like, that's a thing, and that's what they were trying to emulate. Why couldn't they do it? I don't understand. There's nothing more heartbreaking in Valhalla than the first time you have a favorite set of gear and you upgrade it all the way to the mythical, and you're immediately like, fuck, go back, because it looks like a pimp like just threw a bunch of gold on your shit, and it looks really gaudy and stupid now, so you want to go back, and then you realize that you were lied to. You can't. It's stuck that way. Reload a save, you daft fuck, because it's your only salvation. Like, at least just let me like spend another ingot to change the appearance back. So it's something, anything, but just let me change it, and just let me do full transmog. I mean, look... We have to remove about 20 posts a day from the subreddit asking for transmog, so I know I'm not saying anything right. controversial here. But it is just really weird that they straight up told us, like, months ahead, yeah, you know transmog? Yeah, yeah, our game has that. No, it doesn't. <laughs> someone someone from Valhalla, someone on the dev team, let us know what happened there. We want to know. Uh, well, they've, they've also, like, said that there are Viking rap battles. Yeah, flighting. Whatever that's about. I liked flighting. I like the way, I also like the way it worked. The way it would give you charisma. Yeah. Dope. Cool. Whatever. I enjoyed flighting. I want more flighting. I want a flighting spinoff. Flighting, flighting should be, flighting is the naval gameplay of Valhalla. I think it was my favorite, yeah, it was my favorite, like, side activity in the game. I really enjoyed it. 100%. When I saw that little mask icon pop up on my map, I was like, oh, fuck yeah. We're in for a good time. You know what, though? Here, here are two suggestions that might make flighting better. I remember I was telling you, I think it would have been neat if there were multiple options that would give you the win of that round. Because sometimes there sure. aren't multiple. Like, there's just there's just one you have to choose. But also, yeah. it'd be neat if there were charisma-locked options in flighting that you could unlock the more Ooh. flighting games you won previously. Ooh. That would have been cool, too. That's actually that's kind of that's neat. I like that idea. And I also just ultimately, I wish that there was more charisma based choices in the main game that you could utilize because that would have made me feel like, yes, that would make me feel like it was all worth it. So those two things. After telling us that the canon options in the game are the ones that require charisma, you, then there's only like 12 in the whole game. That's not very useful. <laughs> Fighting's cool. I like it. I would like to now say with some pride for a weird flex to the only audience that would understand i never got a single flight wrong in the whole game wow look at you i know i'm i'm really impressive i know don't all line up now to to give me a smooch on the cheek there was one that uh there was one that the guy was being very like sexual in his flights to me and i yeah that was kind of weird and i right? didn't i didn't want to answer with the correct flight because i didn't want it to trigger a romance option 
<laughs> turns out it, that's not what ha- it turns out at the end of it he's like hey you want to go bang and i'm like no because i'm with ranvi <laughs> yeah i was like i don't really want to play into exactly this. <laughs> that was me too i was like i don't know if i want to do this with this guy uh yeah it was a little it was it was a little horny it was a little horny so really at the end of the day what we're expecting out of valhalla is taking the ingredients of gameplay that were introduced by origins and, and changed a little bit in odyssey and putting them towards a more like focused, smaller, cohesive experience. <laughs> that one hurts. That Nothing one hurts. is smaller or more cohesive about it. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck that. You shit, were hoping dude. for the best. Uh. <laughs> uh, and then this is the one, Tim, that as you know is going to haunt you forever. Uh oh. I I'm very optimistic about it. <laughs> I, I think that gameplay was gonna is gonna knock our socks off. <laughs> <laughs> and knock our socks off it did. Fast forwarding to episode six, our Valhalla gameplay demo reactions. We're out of the we're out of the world of episode one. Uh we're into episode six. Here's what we've got. I think this is just a dead ass witch that we're fighting right, right now. Well, this is I mean, a real witch. How often is Eivor going to be drugged? I mean, when when she yeah. fights the witch or the giant wolf, yeah, you know, or has to hack and slash a boss a hundred times. The answer is all the time. Apparently, Eivor gets drugged like every day. <laughs> I think you said that in the episode. <laughs> Eivor gets drugged so many times. It's like it's about as cheap of an excuse as like, oh, it's just an animus hack. I'm like, oh, Avor's just high. Deal with it. Avor's <laughs> just tripping balls through the entirety of the game. She dropped too much acid and started seeing Odin. It's that simple. Yeah. Yeah. I know that you personally are not a big fan of the mythological stuff, right? No, I mean, I'm I guess I'm into it if it's like a contained DLC type deal. Yeah. But when it bleeds into the actual game, I mean because I always prefer the more the more grounded entries. So mm-hmm. until now, <laughs> yeah, it's really ironic because my favorite part of Valhalla is the mythical worlds, <laughs> which I still don't, I can't fully uh, relate to myself. Like I messaged you about it. Like if this popped up in AC two, I'd hate it. Yeah, because there's so little for me to grab onto in Valhalla in general. The mythical, the, the, the mythological worlds are actually pretty cool by comparison and, and so normally i wouldn't like them but i just felt like they were enjoyable in this game and it's funny because i was so ready to be pissed off about them and i actually really enjoyed them yeah and you know something you said about them to I me mean, i think you mentioned on the podcast where you were like well the combat and the weirdness of this this whole game system makes more sense in asgard in the mythological context like i didn't really get what you meant and then it actually took me playing i was playing like the demo uh on stadia to immortals phoenix rising and it's ostensibly the same combat as odyssey but definitely having it in the mythological world of that game just makes it feel more at home i wasn't able to make that connection in valhalla because of the worlds being so similar to england that like it honestly didn't really at least Asgard itself being so similar that like, I didn't really think of myself all the time as being in this mythical astral plane sort of thing, but I totally get it now. Yeah. I I just feel like, you know, the exaggerated movements and like the crazy like kill animations and stuff. And it just makes sense for me more like playing as Javi and and, and fighting these, these Jotner. It just Yatner. it just makes them them Yatner really making a big old problem is, in our backyard. Is that not how you say it? <laughs> I didn't know Yotnar. Those those Yatner <laughs> out there. I... <laughs> them Yatners are really I don't I don't I don't trust them as far as I can throw them myself. <laughs> those Yatners need to stay in Jotunheim and not come on over here to Asgard. <laughs> I reckon I'm gonna get that builder to make me a shield, <laughs> so I don't have to see no more of them Yatner again. <laughs> Go back where you came from, Yatner. <laughs> you need to turn on around, walk on back <laughs> over that bridge, and get back into Jotunheim. All these Jotnar coming across that <laughs> rainbow bridge. 
when I was a boy. You turn your ass, you, you turn your blue ass around and buzz off. <laughs> the way that it was described originally before we had saw very much is that like the combat was crunchy and weighty. Yeah. It doesn't quite look that way. Do you think it's crunchy and weighty? Too? <laughs> no, I, I, I don't think it's crunchy. <laughs> You didn't then either. You still don't. I just wanted to check on that. I wanted to see if you thought it was crunchy and or weighty. That's all. I liked what they talked about in the forward demo of, you know, you see a house out and about. It's got a chest in it. And then there's kind of a puzzle you'll have to figure out to get access to that chest. And that's maybe the one thing I truly love about this. Game. I know. Yeah, it's yeah, it's. You you had no idea about just how much you would have you, you were actually going to enjoy that system. It's like even hearing about that idea, like many things, I just didn't trust them to do it as well as they ended up doing huh, it. For sure, for sure. Like it was a good idea, but I was like, are they really all going to be different little puzzles that are all interesting? I mean, obviously some of them are, are they're not all winners, but I very rarely felt like I was repeating a puzzle. Some of them are really, really awesome and rewarding. So totally. Some very memorable ones. To to go back to our first like Valhalla episode when we played the game, I was pretty negative about it. I completely came around on it. They are awesome and I really enjoyed them. Yeah, I think you just hadn't done any of them at that point. It was like you'd only played for nine hours. So, of course, you only saw 0.00004% of the content <laughs> of the game by that point. So I forgive you. I want you to know I forgive you. Thank you. you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Something I do care deeply about as an Assassin's Creed fan is what's happening in the modern day story. And knowing that I can come across bits and pieces of it in the in the overworld of the game, in the main game, that's like that's awesome. And it was kinda. It was pretty awesome. Do you mean just the modern day in general? Yeah, it's maybe not clear in the clip. I'm talking about the anomalies there. Oh, the, yeah, the anomalies were, were, were cool. Warning. Very mild spoilers for the modern day incoming. Skip to 43 minutes and 20 seconds to avoid. They were. The anomalies were great. Overall, modern day in this game was not. <laughs> not great. Not great. No, no, no. I want to, I still, I still want to give him credit that things happened. There were things that happened in it. That's good. Okay. Well, here's a hot take. Actually, I would have preferred unity level of modern day <laughs> over, over, over what actually did happen. Totally would prefer unity. Mm, disagree. Hard disagree. I, I have more respect for ambition that fails than I do for lack of ambition. Well, but you said before though, that like you think that unity's modern day is better than say origins because it doesn't it's not trying i just don't think that i could describe origins as modern day as ambitious like it's it's actually very very unambitious and it's pretending to be ambitious and that's what i don't like about origins is that there's technically third person playable modern day but nothing happens and there's no story or character to it at all whatsoever so it's it's like the same I'm left with the same feelings that I had in Unity but at least with Unity it was all cutscenes anyway it was never pretending to be more than it was Origins is pretending to be more than it was Valhalla is exactly what it seems to be it just isn't good <laughs> That's fair I I suppose I just there was enough about Valhalla modern day that pissed me off that I would have just preferred just Unity again Definitely some poor choices I, I I want to respect that they took swings with it. Like they they had a big idea for it and they they did it. And but like with, you know, say Odyssey, right? Where that's kind of a big swing having a Cassandra or Alexio show up in the modern day and also bad, just like Valhalla. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. I, I prefer both of those approaches to to what Unity gave us personally. But I, I feel like is bad modern day better than no modern day? I vote yes, but if you think differently, I understand. No, I think no, I think I think bad modern day is but well, it's it's it, it, it's tricky because I can recognize the ambition, I appreciate it. And you and I were both like we you and I are both so excited after that first modern day scene. I just feel like the way things wrapped up, yeah, were so unsatisfying in a way that like I would have rather them just take a break and not do it in this game and let someone else do it. You know what I mean? Right, or you have that feeling, as I think a lot of people have, where it's like, you have the opportunity to be conclusive. Like, 
a good ending, and and this is coming straight from the world of TV. When a season of TV ends, you want to feel mostly concluded, but you want that one little dangling thread to pick up on in the next season, right? At least, at least one little dangling thread. If you have everything is left open, you you are more interested in dying than you are in watching the next season at that point, (laughs) because it's just like so frustrating. And then it gets canceled and you're like, well, fuck me, fuck my life, I guess. Because everything's on the cliffhanger and never gets resolved, right? Yeah. Happens all the time. And it makes you go, okay, well, if you're a writer and you're writing something you're not guaranteed to get a follow-up to, don't play that game. Just conclude it. Leave one thread, just a single thing, a single question. You know, Daredevil season three ended and there was a little tease of Bullseye and that was all that they needed. Yeah, it ended very conclusively otherwise. Exactly. And, and like, that's the thing is, is, is there is a craft to like, like making a cliffhanger not frustrate you. Yes. Not to get out too off topic, but that is a great example of Daredevil because they have like, oh, well, what if Kingpin gets out or what if Bullseye comes back? But it ends so conclusively that the show can get canceled like it did and people aren't like, you know, angry. They're angry for other reasons. The single defining factor of like, is a cliffhanger acceptable, in my opinion, is is entirely to do with your confidence that there will be a follow-up because, you know, okay, Spider-Man Far From Home, spoilers for that movie. It ends with Peter Parker's identity being revealed to the public. That's a fat cliffhanger, right? But you know Spider-Man 3 happens eventually. Like, you know that that movie gets made because, of course, it will. You know there will be a response to it. With Assassin's Creed, we know there's going to be another game. But like I pointed out on Twitter... Syndicate modern day had a pretty sizable cliffhanger. It was definitely more satisfying than this. Like syndicates modern day had a reasonable conclusion. And then it brought up that thread of you have Violet DaCosta, the instruments of the first will they're up to no good. Of course that never gets followed up on in a game. It ultimately gets resolved in a comic that nobody reads. So now I've been created, I've been given the expectation that Anything interesting you could say happened at the end of this modern day story, which I'll try not to get into spoilers for the sake of anyone listening who hasn't gotten there yet. I just don't have any faith that they'll follow up on it, nor do I really like what they did there. But for all the talk in this game of something conclusive, all the Easter eggs and entry points from other games that kind of get referenced and connected and brought in, you're really led to believe that you're going to get some finality. And there is no finality. And it just feels like a completely wasted opportunity. And I hope, I hope that the people involved knew exactly what they were doing. They knew exactly what the next game wanted to do. They fed into it deliberately and it was all constructed with the grander vision in mind. But I have no reason to believe that that happened. Syndicate is still out there just being like the unsung champion of, of modern day in, in these games. We've, we've said it many times. If we had gotten syndicate style again and like i would have much preferred that over what we actually did get the the fact that there's like a grander threat even though i dock some points for it being a really cheap and forced grander threat is like we haven't seen that in years that there's like an actual ticking clock of something that's a problem that imminently needs solving and a mystery a question that needs answering in this game it has a lot of the ingredients it just doesn't come out to a dish that isn't shitty garbage trash. We're so in the weeds on this. We've got more clips to listen to, my guy. <laughs> Can we listen? Do you want to listen to some more clips? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, cool. I'm I'm ready to love this game. I'm open to loving this game because the truth is my standards are very low. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they've really whittled me down to the point where like I should not be in a point I should not be in a position where seeing an assassin Makes me excited. <laughs> My expectations were low. And it still didn't meet them. <laughs> yeah, me too. Same. <laughs> I hate that because, like, again, I'm very easily impressed. All this game had to do was be decent. <laughs> and I would have probably loved it. Like, just if it was functional. Like, keep in mind, I love, like, Assassin's Creed Syndicate. That's, like, the textbook example of a story in Assassin's Creed that's Purely functional, but it's nothing special. Doesn't hit a strong emotional impact. It doesn't hit, uh, you know, a thematic resonance. Valhalla's story is also just not functional. It's not emotional or thematically resonant. It's also just not 
functional. There's like I said in previous episodes, it's it's a it's like five hours worth of story and it's all very rushed and it's spread across hundreds of hours of extraneous superfluous bullshit. But uh anyway, low standards loss and that's what they call me. We got important <laughs> stuff to talk about. Like how um, social stealth is back. Uh, yeah, I guess. Can we just talk about how appropriate that reaction was and I didn't even realize it? <laughs> I just, one more time, one more time. We got important <laughs> stuff to talk about. Like how um, social stealth is back. Uh, yeah, I guess. <laughs> you were so right. And you captured so much sentiment in just that one. And I was sitting there thinking at the time, I was going, why is he being... Why is he being shitty about social <laughs> stealth? We love that. We love that it's back. Don't we love social <laughs> stealth? But you must have knew. You must have seen. <laughs> uh, Damn. There's just there was just nothing indicating that it was going to be anything more than just like occasional. There was, you know, it's like it was just a little like, hey, put on your hood and blend in. Or that it would work. Or that it would work. Yeah. Ugh. But in this game, you can just, I guess you could always have your hood and cloak on it as it, as it seems. Yeah, and that's cool because I like that. <laughs> it's good. Yeah. Do I just it, have a stroke? It sucks that we have to. Huh? Do I just have a stroke? Maybe. I said that's cool because I like that and it's good. <laughs> <laughs> can, you make, can you make that your ringtone? <laughs> All right. Now, I mostly included that because it amuses me, but it also did technically include us saying a thing that was wrong. So <laughs> it fits with this episode. Because I can you just have your cloak on all the time? I mean, there are times where it takes it off of you, but in cutscenes and stuff, it, it can totally always be on, yeah. Oh, then never mind. We weren't wrong. But I also, I titled, because I, I had to put titles on all these sound clips that I, that I took. This one's called Cloak and Stroke. Like, during combat, you pop your hood up, but then you can pull it right back down. Damn. So. You really didn't appreciate that I called that clip Cloak and Stroke. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you. Essentially, your health won't restore automatically. So if you get really low on health, right. you have to eat food. <laughs> right? Yeah, because that was yeah that was mentioned in the official one. I, I think because you had to like, because in the world of eat. video games, everyone has always loved hunger systems <laughs> and having to hunt and and having to hunt in Assassin's Creed games. I am on a. I've always been on a personal mission to avoid hunting as much as possible. And I feel like this is a choice they made specifically to fuck with me. Yeah, just you specifically. Just me. Just me specifically. Yeah, we were very wrong about that. Apparently it's just mushrooms. They presented it, though, in, in, in the way of, like, hey, go kill a deer to get rations. You know, like, like that was the way that they yeah, I swear it. I thought that I would be able to get rations by fishing. I, I definitely, I could not have made, I don't think I pulled that out of my ass. But I definitely tried while playing the game to, like, I went into my inventory. I, I needed rations. I saw that I had fish. I was like, why can't I eat any of these? Why can't I turn these into well, rations? Well, you do get rations from fishing, but the fish is separate in your inventory. Oh, really? I'm pretty sure. I know for certain you get rations from killing any of the random animals. You get rations for killing animals? Yeah. If you shoot a deer or fox or squirrel, you can pick up rations and leather. What? It's just there's not. How did I, how did I miss there's that? There's just, you, you know, well, it's because you didn't play Vinland first, you fuck. Ugh. <laughs> God. No, I'm, I'm just saying, like, they, they, they tutorialize it in Vinland, but not in the actual game. So you can go fuck yourself. <laughs> I swear I missed that. Cause, like, yeah, I would look at my inventory and be like, how do I turn the deer meat into food? Yeah, the deer meat is, is, is a separate thing that you can sell, but you do get a ration from killing the deer or fox or whatever it is, or bear. Fuck, fuck me, dude, I guess. So it's not like the, the, the health, the medicine, if you, whatever, you, if you, you can just call it medicine. The medicine, is always on your person. You can use it, but you have to either kill animals or collect them with raspberries and stuff. So I don't, I don't I, love that I understand either. what you're saying. I just never noticed that. Well, I played this game for 130 well, I'm just, hours. I'm just saying. And I just never realized. I'm just saying like based off of what we were saying in that clip, it's not like you yeah. can't hold on to the things that you get from hunting. You can. So I can go hunting for an no, hour and, we, and hold on we to We also just weren't wrong. Like I thought... I thought I was wrong, and I thought the only way you could get rations was with mushrooms or winter chanterelle or whatever. Right. But um, but no, I guess, yeah, hunting and fishing do give you rations, so it is 
exactly what we thought it was. But the, and I the, just, the issue I'm, is... I'm just colossally stupid. It's Tim. not like... I'm can, really fucking stupid. It's not like you have to come from a battle and go hunt an animal and eat it. You can hunt an animal preemptive to the battle I, and have the ration. So that's the only difference. I want you to know, Tim, I completely understand how the system works. No, I know that you understand. <laughs> I, just, I am just criticizing <laughs> what I said in the clip. Okay. I know you I get it. <laughs> I thought I feel like you've been trying to explain it to me this whole time. No, like, no, Tim, I get I it. I know you get it. And then you'll be like, <laughs> you'll say like, well, rations are like medicine, and I'm like, I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, Lawson, this is how rations work in this game. <laughs> uh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, don't fucking tell me again how the hunger works. I, I, the, I kept repeating myself because I wanted you to know that I wasn't talking to you. I was talking to my past self. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad we were able to sort that out. <laughs> I'm glad we worked through it together. <laughs> the whole time, you're just like, I, no, I'm just stupid. I'm like, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, oh, my God. I'm I'm moving on. Yeah. <laughs> Next clip. I just hope they let me get the Sisterhood logo as a face tattoo on my forehead. Right. Well, yeah. Well, well I think I'm sure that there will be tattoos that you could get, like, sleeves. And then there are armor mm-hmm. sets that probably show off your arms a little more. Yeah. I don't know. I just feel like having a tattoo on your back. Because I feel like it'll also be in their style to like, you know, maybe there'll be a little blurb of text with some cute reference to like. Right, right, right. You know, there's I'm, Amunet, there's sisters, and they right. stab people, you know. It'll be I'm good. I'm wondering, I'm wondering if like each tattoo, for instance, might have multiple placement options. Like, Yeah, we really don't know a lot about exactly how the tattoo system will work. Like maybe if I want to put the sisterhood like on my arm, I could do that instead. Like I think that'd be interesting. If you can't customize it at all, it'll be a little boring. And it was. <laughs> yeah, they it, they don't have different placements. They only go where you want, where, where they say they can go. And it would be interesting if, like you said, if there was like armor that showed off the tattoos. But I guess the answer to that is you're just supposed to, if you want your tattoos to be visible, you just toggle the visibility yep. of your armor off. It would make more sense, like just in within the world, if like the bear gear didn't show off any parts of your body at all. But the wolf gear, perhaps, because it's more more like light and stealth oriented that it would show off more of your arms at least Mm. that'd be one thing that makes sense as it stands it is pretty silly because yeah if you keep your gear visible you're pretty much never going to see any of your tattoos other than your face tattoos not even a little just sad it's it's a little like it's again it's like you've put this time and effort and there's all these collectibles i'm supposed to be able to grab and it's they're like the worst collectibles in the game to actually acquire (laughs) and as a reward I can realize after about six arcs of the game that I will never even be conscious of what tattoos I have on and therefore I'll never use them. Uh, let me be clear though. As soon as I got that sisterhood tattoo, I, I slapped that shit yeah, on. Yeah, me too. Because, you know, I'm an ally and I care. It would have been neat if you like, could have just put it on your arm or your or somewhere on your face. Like, why just limit it to the back where no one can see it? <laughs> I want it on my earlobe <laughs> right now. I'll have to protest this by actually just getting that logo tattooed on my forehead. It's a pretty... Like, then... It's a pretty sexy logo. Then Sebastian would love me. It's a pretty sexy logo, not gonna lie. It's pretty great. It's a really good logo. We love you, sisterhood people. Okay, next clip. He kind of implies that maybe the whole alliances thing got overblown early on. (laughs) And that it's not quite that we get to choose who we ally with. More that the alliances are dictated by the story and will, you know, evolve as a consequence of the story, which is a good thing. I mean, a fully free-form, open-ended alliance system probably would not be able to produce much actual gameplay content other than like, oh, if I align with this tribe, they'll send 50-plus more resources to my <laughs> settlement, you know, some right. homestead convoy type shit. But if it's all part of the story, then it kind of addresses something that you know, we talked about last week with Blue, (laughs) where if I can always at any moment be fighting for either side, it's going to be boring. But if the story says, right now you're fighting for these people, and then gives you a reason that in the next sequence you're fighting for those people, (laughs) that can be very rewarding. (laughs) Look, man, I just, 
I love how in so many of these clips, I hear something that's like basically bad news, and I'm like, well, here's why it's actually really good. <laughs> and then and then it ends up not actually being that good. You're being and you're being know. an optimist. I'm so I I am. I am an optimist, Tim. I, every time we talk about the future of Assassin's Creed, you're like, this shit sucks. It's gonna <laughs> suck forever until I die. And I'm like, maybe not though. <laughs> the next game might be good. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and like everything i'm saying in this clip is reasonable speculation no, for sure, like for sure. you know darby says the alliances have to do with story what goes on in my head i think okay darby plus story equals good <laughs> alliances therefore by the transitive property must be good speaking of alliances if it's being treated as a story point who I'm allied with. And, you know, maybe I'm, I'm sure there is actually quite a bit of choice <laughs> in terms of like who you ally with and how that affects the story. <laughs> it just seems like his, his answer indicates a more, you know, handcrafted system than just, <laughs> All right, you fuck this person, you'll align with this tribe and they'll give you these resources. And if you fuck that person and so on and so forth. <laughs> I just want to highlight the quote. And I'm sure there will be quite a bit of choice. There was not even. There was not. The the, the guy that you're, you're you're hanging out with at, at the wedding could have died. Like so, I think the worst case scenario in that regard is that all those things can happen, and 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 you can make the choices that set those things in motion. Yeah. However, what if they just don't matter? <laughs> come the end of the game so that's yeah. the worst case scenario there, <laughs> is that you can make these choices early on and they don't have an effect later on <laughs> i'll have you know i had named that clip tim stradamus <laughs> <laughs> worst case scenario what if the choices don't matter at the end <laughs> damn tim i think that would be the worst case scenario damn he wasn't lying that really is the worst case scenario damn he wasn't lying <laughs> the choices didn't matter it, it, yeah the, it, you can make the choice but it doesn't really affect anything <laughs> the next clip is called lostradamus but i don't remember why let's see what's up you can build a bureau for assassins and then you can talk to Basim in there and he'll send you to kill people that sounds fun it seems like maybe those assassin missions might like they're they're based in the cities and they have more of a focus on social stealth it's like they're taking a little assassin's creed game <laughs> and they're putting it into like it's 10 percent of a game that otherwise has nothing to do with assassin's creed it's like <laughs> i never thought about it like that like like hey guys do you want the assassin's creed part of this game well, go build the bureau in your settlement, and we'll give you a a, 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 a tiny bit of it. It's gonna be there. All the missions will probably be in the cities, and they'll have social stealth. Yeah, pretty much. And you know what's funny about that? And I I don't consider this a spoiler because people are talking openly about it on Twitter. The whole idea that the cities are essentially a stealth remake of AC One, eh. which is more or less true. What I want to know is this is the question of the day. If you counted the time that you spent on those three arcs and you added it up, how much more time does it take to do just those arcs than it takes to play Assassin's Creed 1? <laughs> yeah. What do you as, think? As an experiment, I went back and, and I'm replaying AC2. Yeah. And I am uh, just about done. I'm getting up some codex pages and I am 12 hours in. <laughs> yeah. And I've done the Altair armor and... Like, so I, I've done yeah. that. I've completely upgraded the Mo Monergioni for the most part. Like, I, I'm doing the side content. I'm doing the assassination contracts, too. I'm still only at 12 hours. Yeah, I'm I'm checking out. Apparently, to beat Assassin's Creed 1, it would take you, like, it says 15 hours. There probably aren't 15 hours in those three arcs of Valhalla, but damn. I bet it's probably, like seven i don't know each arc i mean it feels like they take like three hours a piece uh most so like you know that could be nine hours there in just those three arcs that could be pretty close to just a remake of ac1 and that's uh terrifying actually because it makes me feel like the odds are not as good that we'll actually get a real remake of ac1 which i'd i'd really like to see you know yeah you'll be in the main missions 
and there will be these really deep, gritty, dark stories with, you know, themes of honor and glory or whatever the fuck. And it's all very serious, self-important. And then there's like a side quest where you run into a prisoner and she's like, I need you to get a bunch of these eggs for me. And then you bring her the eggs and then she eats them so that she can fart really, really loud and hard and smelly to disrupt someone else in the prison, I think. I I, I didn't pay that close attention. Yeah. <laughs> World events. Yeah. Some of them are pretty silly. How do you think, from all the ones that you played, like, do you feel like the silly ones threw off the tonal balance of the whole game? Or were they contextualized as such brief minor diversions that it didn't really make as much of an impact? What do you think? Yeah. There, I definitely like. There are probably ten out of all of the world events I've done that I actually like enjoyed. Not so much enjoyed, but what I mean is that I felt, you know, like had like a neat little story attached to it. Out of all the ones yeah. I've done, I enjoyed a lot of world events that I played. Certainly more hits than misses in my experience, but I, I, yeah, I don't know that I feel like the balance of just because they're all so short. Even though there are quite a few of them. Like, even though some of them get really goofy, I ultimately didn't feel like it it threw off or confused the tone of the game. It would have been neat, like, <clears throat> I know I've said this before, but if war events led you to certain things, like, it'd be cool if a war event, like, spawned a quest line. That would have been cool. Like, not all of them, obviously, mm -hmm. but maybe just a handful led you to, like, cool quest lines. Yeah, no, agreed. Completely. Well, also, is there nothing impactful to do in these Asgard sequences if it's just a drug trip? Yeah, if it's just a combat horde mode simulator or something, I would rather freeze my balls off, actually. Turned out it is more than a combat simulator horde mode thing. And I still kind of wanted to freeze my balls off, though. Yeah, it's certainly more meaningful than what we originally thought it was going to be, that's for sure. Definitely more important to the overall Definitely. game. All right, here's the last clip that I that I took. If this is so good that it just makes me go, I would never trade this in for a more right. conventional game with a, a straightforward player choice or a straightforward, you know, protagonist gender. Yeah, that would make a difference to my perception. And ultimately, it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, not really. I mean, so, you know, broadly speaking across all of these things, it's really interesting how if you listen through from like, episode one to this episode of the podcast, everything that we talked about Valhalla, it goes from like huge excitement to like, we've started to temper that excitement with like, Oh, you know what? There's some things about this that I'm not super stoked about. And I think even going into the game with those lower expectations, I was still disappointed. Yeah, definitely. It's interesting. I think that a lot of the players who they start out with this game and they're really impressed by the fact that there's a little bit more narrative significance. There's a little bit more, like there's certainly a higher quantity of like actual story things happening at any given moment uh, that people are like, wow, this is really great. And I think that more and more what we're going to see is players reach the end and they go, yeah, I'm not so sure about this whole thing. And that'll be the beginning of the, the end for the honeymoon phase with Valhalla. Yeah, there's certainly a very strong honeymoon phase going around. Definitely. And look, if you love the game, I don't want to take that away from you. But you're but also. You might feel differently about it in a month or two. That, yeah, exactly. That's all. Like, I'm not telling you, you know, hey, right now you're actually dumb and stupid, but a month from now you'll have the perspective that we do and you'll be smart and cool. Um, I'm not saying that. What you're saying is they will never be smart and cool. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. If you like Assassin's Creed Valhalla, you are dumb and stupid. Just kidding. You're not. And I'm glad that you like the game. I wish I liked the game. Yeah, me too. I... <laughs> <laughs> oh, to be so burdened by my intellectual superiority that I cannot enjoy this fucking game. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, guys. I'm serious. I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Valhalla is fine. Ultimately, at the end of the day, I think that gives you a pretty good perspective on how the reality of Valhalla compared to our expectations of it some little moments, things we thought were true, ended up not being true. Some things that we thought might happen, worst case scenarios usually, <laughs> didn't yeah, up being true. Definitely. You know, and there may have been people who are listening now that didn't hear those earlier episodes. So it'd be nice for them to to get that. Right. If you're if you've never listened before, this is like we're giving you like four episodes in one here. This is like They're a getting really a good great deal. value. Huge bang for your buck. <laughs>
<laughs> hey, so listen, if you enjoy this show at all, uh, you can show us your enjoyment and appreciation of the episode uh, one of several ways. You can leave us a comment, a pretty little comment in our comment section down below. That is if you're on YouTube. If you're not on YouTube, we do have a Twitter, at HookBlade, where you can tweet at us, tell us your thoughts and ideas and responses to things. And uh, we appreciate those things very much. If you're on iTunes, Apple, you can leave a review, five-star review, or a one-star review, honestly. Whatever, whatever you feel in your heart, that helps us a lot as well. And uh, we appreciate your support. We appreciate Thank you so you much. <laughs> Stay tuned and subscribe. And most importantly, subscribe. And keep your hands ready on the trigger. <laughs> on the... on. <laughs> To kill yourself after <laughs> listening to this episode. <laughs> I thought you were about to, I thought you were about to say like like <laughs> button or something or no nope, trigger. trigger. <laughs> this has gone very dark. Very keep quickly. your hand on the quiver. <laughs> well, I have been the hook. I've been the blade. Good night, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs> <laughs> So you can use one for the other. The other, the other.